nearly 8,000 years of war making, just warped uh, people's thinking and worldview and government's actions, and, and it just twisted them into knots. And as a result of this existential threat, uh, most many governments just felt they had a license to do whatever had to be done. And as a result, even though we had managed to, serve, uh, to get past World War II, we continued to misbehave and do awful things, but always justified by national security, and that was always justified by the nuclear threat. So we had a 44-year dysfunctional era. It's like a kid that grew, grew up in a dysfunctional family, but not for 17 years and then left home, but for 44 years. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of damage to be repaired. Uh the United States, of all the countries in the world, the country to have major, well, how would you say, uh, behavioral problems, this is not the one, um, but we have we have sunk to that. So an era of truth-telling, resolution, not an era of litigation and endless uh, recriminations, but rather truth-telling, reconciliation, and so forth, would have a phenomenal impact on our ability to move forward as a global civilization. Because right now, we're not going anywhere. We're going backwards. We've got so many groups and individuals that want to take us back, back, back. We've got this politician wants to take us back to 1950. You've got another politician who wants to take us back to 1920. And you've got, the, you've got radical uh, religious groups around the world want to take us back to the 11th century. Uh, this is a reaction to dysfunction. Uh, a, a, a failure of belief in a better future. It's frustration, and it's dysfunctional, just like dysfunctional people and families. They they can't go forward. They can't function well. They decay. They become addicts. Uh, they end up on a street with a little cardboard sign, whatever. Th this has to change. We're, we're running out of time to make a course correction. Fortunately, we have an event right at our fingertips, which could completely change the course and allow us to go in the direction we need to go. And it starts with one simple but extraordinarily profound truth. My fellow citizens, we have been engaged by extraterrestrials for a long time, certainly 70 years, possibly thousands of years. We couldn't tell you before for national security reasons, but today we are telling you. And then thus it begins. Yeah, but then, you know, you're going to have a certain amount of the population they are going to start, you know, thinking, oh, doomsday, too, if it's not worded right. I mean, you got to look at it that way. I mean, it, they need to at least disclose enough, I mean, to let the people either make them feel more comfortable or let them know what's going on if there is going to be a problem. Well yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Uh, after disclosure, capital D, comes disclosure, small d. And, and uh, what are we going to learn? How much is the government going to reveal? This will be up to the citizens in the post-disclosure world. I certainly will be doing my part. Uh, it's going to be an intense, complicated, but fascinating time. It's going to take time for the small d disclosure process to start really registering. Keep in mind, when the government makes the announcement, they're going to have evidence to back it up. They just not come out and say, take my word for it. I mean, they've got, uh, there's already plenty of evidence in the public domain, but they'll have their own special private evidence and government-based evidence, and they'll do that. Uh, and you know, the fact that some people want to panic, people panic every day, there's nothing new about that. Um, so that's not, that doesn't really concern me that much. Um, uh, the truth is not a, a, a panacea. It's not a utopian solution. It's just superior to lies. History has made it very clear that the truth process, truth in government, truth in relationships, does not create some perfect world or some perfect relationship. It just has a better chance of a positive outcome than the lies. It's just, you know, in other words, your probabilities are going up. You're, you're working the odds better. You're taking a path that has a higher odds of succeeding. It's like people that go to Vegas and, and play blackjack with a system where the odds are 
close to 50-50, and other people go play Keno, where the odds are ridiculous, or buy lottery tickets. And so lying is, is simply statistically superior way to go if you want to be uh, very um, uh, 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 mathematical and, and nuts and bolts about it. But it's true. Uh, and But lying is, is convenient in the short term. This is uh, the, the reality of things. You get a short-term benefit from a lie uh, in, in so many ways, and there's so many kinds of lies. Just like you get a short-term rush from a, an injection of heroin. Oh, yeah. Long-term. Long-term, no, it is not better. In the long-term, you lose. You get a short-term benefit, long-term detriment. Uh, and and, and a, a long-term existential problem. And again, with long-term heroin, you die. Uh, and long-term institutional lying, yeah, you have wars, you have calamities, God knows. I mean, every, every, every soldier that died in the Middle East since 2003 uh, from a series of war initiated by a, a war of, a preemptive war of aggression based upon known lies and eventually established lies, that was an existential outcome for them. They were killed by those lies. Had they told the truth, many of those thousands of men and women would still be alive. Well, you can apply that to a global uh, context as well. If we don't get out of the line business and into the truth business, I assure you the world is not going to end well. No. And, you know, people, I, you know, because I'm a senior citizen myself. I'm 66. I don't know how old you are. But I, I find, you know, like I have had people call up on my show. They're all upset about what's going on with Social Security, the major cuts. I mean, without the public even knowing what's going on, they're just doing stuff. People are getting to the point where they mistrust the government more and more. So this is the time they need to, you know, disclose stuff and be start being honest with people and let them know what. What is this going on? Be it from something that's visiting our planet or, you know, our our politics, the way it's being done. They need to clean up their act big time. Well, they're not. And in fact, the amount of lying is increased. So at this point, we're headed in the wrong direction. Uh, and so 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 quickly in the wrong direction that there are, there are alarms going off in various segments, various uh, seg- pun- punditry uh, rooms or punditry segments, centers uh, about what could happen. Um, so um, the use of lies to get what you want in terms of politically has just escalated, uh, which is kind of, it's kind of like the addict who um, is addicted to a substance and can't break it. And so they start taking more and more and more and more and more. And now they're virtually high all the time until they eventually collapse in the middle of the street and die. The last days of the addict's dilemma. Well, America and other governments, but let's talk about ours, is addicted to lying now, and it's becoming worse. And the outcome will be similar. There will be an existential outcome, extremely unpleasant. And as I said, for all the soldiers that have died in the Middle East since 2003, that existential outcome has already arrived. Oh, yeah. And that, you know, and it's so sad, you know, I not just because they passed, you know, a lot of them came back main uh, and suffering mental problems, all this stuff for if for, and you sit back, you know, I remember my days back in the military back in the Vietnam era. And and I got home and I, I said to myself, why, why why was I even there? Let alone. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you saying that you were in Vietnam? I was in Vietnam, and I don't want to talk about it. It's, it's one subject I I don't talk. I right. I will say I was there. Uh, it's a long okay. story, but I'll tell you that uh, you know when you come back and you were treated not very good by you know the population. Number one, two is mm-hmm. when you got back, you get, you said. Well, you know, I could see, you know, my dad served during World War II and the Korean War, and he had his stories, and he knew why he served. I came back, yeah. and I go to myself, oh, my God, you know, I, I lost some close friends, and I sat back and wondered why. I mean, you know, and it, it, it took me years of nightmares of, you know, just to get over it. Well, I... I uh I certainly respect what you went through and and uh am glad that you were able to get past that um 
one of the things that's starting, uh, it's getting a little bit of attention. You can find the odd article about this. Uh, you're going to hear more about it soon. But again, there's just one story in play right now. But And that is, is they're beginning to understand better the moral component of PTSD. Uh, in other words, uh, it's not just about I saw something terrible or uh, I nearly died or uh, the, 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 ba- the, 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 the noise and the turmoil of battle has left me confused. It's also about going through these things, uh, often knowing from the get-go that you did not have the moral ground. Uh, and I'll tell you, <laughs> that, that, that just has, yeah, and the reason that hasn't been talked about is because if you go there, then you are forced to confront America's misdeeds and misbehavior. And, of course, the government doesn't want that, and the politicians don't want that. It, it doesn't get votes. It's a negative. But it's extremely significant. Uh, I can assure you that if <laughs> if somebody literally broke into your house and was attacking one of your family members with a knife and you pulled a gun and shot them dead, you would have some PTSD afterwards. You would, you would be affected it, it, and you'd be affected a lot, particularly if you'd never done it before. Oh yeah. On the other hand, if you were uh, out in your car driving on the freeway and somebody cut you off and you lost your temper and they got out of the car, and you got out of the car, you pulled a gun and killed them, and they hadn't even attacked you yet, your PTSD would be much greater. Debilitating. Also, you might end up in jail, prison for a long time. Uh, in other words, the, the, you, the, same, the situation is shame. You killed the person with a gun. But the moral status of your moral status at the at the time of the act is dramatically different and unless you're a sociopath with no conscience at all and there are people like that and you need to avoid them like a plague uh your your ability to deal with it will be far more difficult and so uh we're starting to see the articles which are essentially addressing this uh and whether the government likes it or not nobody you know, we don't care and that is is that a great deal of the PTSD that our vets are experiencing is because they were sent out to to be involved in immoral government actions uh, based on lies, based on awful policies, uh, and it's hard to live with themselves. And that is the reason for the high suicide rates. It's not that they're shell-shocked and having nightmares. It's because fundamentally down deep, they feel absolutely ashamed. Well, and they can't do it. I can say this. I know we're a little off the subject, but I, my, my grandmother or, or, and my great grandfather brought the Mennonite church over uh, from U- Ukraine, the German area. Oh, you know, back mm-hmm. uh, before the turn of the century, uh, or I should say my great grandmother and all that. And grandfather and you know a lot of my i grew up a lot of my family were mennonite my father was catholic my uh, mom was uh well she didn't i don't even think she ever talked about religion as such but they let me choose my own church which i ended up going to a protestant church down the road and my parents let me do what i wanted to do but you know i i grew up with a very strong religious background so, you know, mm-hmm. uh, when I went in the Army, I actually, and I'm not going to go into too much, but, uh, you know, the recruiters, especially at that time, they were uh, trying to go into a voluntary Army uh, arm, uh, army at that time. Uh, you know, they lied to you. I was naive. I was young. And, uh, you know, I enlisted. Uh, I thought I was going to be a company clerk or something. That's what they promised me. Well, that wasn't the case. So, you know, I, the, the, and I... 
fought it in basic training. I, I fought it for a while. I refused to pick up a gun. And, uh, boy, did I get punished a lot for that. Boy, physically. Sure. And, yeah. And, I'm surprised they didn't cashier you. I'm amazed that they didn't cashier you out, but apparently not. No, they didn't do that. They just put me in a stockade halfway through basic training and uh, and put me on a transport uh, plane to Vietnam. That's the 